the general purpose of the House of Representatives was to represent Americans proportionately. But as the American population has grown, the size of the House has not. Danielle Allen, a columnist with The Washington Post, writes extensively about this. One of her recent pieces was titled, Just How Big Should the House Be? So let's do the math. Danielle joins me now. She's the director of the Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University, founder of the Allen Lab for Democracy Renovation at Harvard, and author of several books, including the upcoming Justice by Means of Democracy. Danielle, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you, Ali. And you did a great job reviewing the issue just now. I really appreciate that. Well, I appreciate that. But thanks to you for publishing on this, because it makes us think about things that we don't often think about. I think the reaction of most people, if you ask them, is that we owe way too many people in Congress. Uh, we don't get enough done there anyway. But when you look at other countries and you compare them, they have a lot more representatives. So give me a sense of what expanding the House would do for the American people. That's right. I mean, it's true. A lot of people do say, gosh, you know, I can't stand Congress as it is. What are you talking about, Danielle? More of them really come on now. Or they'll say, I haven't thought about that at all. And that's a really interesting idea. And it's true that then when you make the comparison to other countries, you realize the British Parliament is bigger than our House of Representatives is. So is the German Bundestag. Their populations are much smaller. They still have functionality. The really important thing is that if we could shrink the size of districts again, bring representatives closer to their constituents, you'll get more responsiveness. You'll get better constituent services, but you'll also get what the founders call due dependence on the people. It will mean that it's easier to hold elected officers accountable. Money will have less influence than it currently does in our politics. One of the things that you write about is the impact that social media has had on democracy and that social media fundamentally undermines the role of uh, the, the representative. Here's what you wrote. James Madison anticipated that the breadth of a broad republic, our very rivers and mountains, would protect against the formation of dangerous factions because it would be hard for people with extreme views to find each other and to coordinate. Because of geographic dispersal, people would have to go through representatives to get their views into the public sphere, and this would mitigate the impact of faction, end quote. Tell me about that. Absolutely. So, I mean, in the beginning idea, the founders were very concerned about factionalism and tribalism. They lived through a polarized time full of conflict as well. In the 1780s, the first Congress, you know, couldn't get a quorum. They couldn't pass a budget. They couldn't pay war debts, they worked on the Constitution. They decided to write the Constitution to solve those problems. The solution was supposed to be a stronger system of representation. That meant, you know, not direct democracy and the like, but it was also the idea that geographic dispersal itself would keep people with extreme views from finding each other. They would have to go through representatives to get their views into the public sphere. That obviously doesn't work anymore. We cannot depend on geographic dispersal to be a break on faction. So we really have to find other approaches. Increasing the size of the House, having smaller districts will help. I think of this partly as solving, say, the George Santos problem. Why was it possible for George Santos to get through with the amount of fraud that he had on his record? Partly because there wasn't enough direct knowledge of him within the community of people voting for him. So if we could bring that ratio down again, we can restore the notion that people are really more connected to their constituents, that their constituents can know who they are. We can better process um, who's getting elected into office. You co-chaired a bipartisan commission on democracy renovation uh, with the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The commission recently published a report, and it floats seven potential paths to expanding the House. Uh, and depending on which one you look at, it, it could increase the House from uh, 500,000 to, to 500 uh, members. One of the plans is more than 9,000 representatives. And some of these options rely on historic ratios. If you take the nation's founding ratio of 35,000 constituents per representative, you'd end up with about 9,400 representatives. So what, what path makes more sense and how big should we get? Well, there are two realistic paths on the table right now, both put forward by members of Congress. Uh, Representative Blumenhauer from Oregon has put forward a number of 585 based on what I call the deferred maintenance rule, and I'll explain that in a second. And then Representative Kasten of Illinois has put forward a number of 572 based on what's called the Wyoming rule. So the deferred maintenance rule is the idea that when we capped the House in 1929 at 435, ever since then, 
states have had to lose seats to give them to other states that were growing. So as we stayed 435, you know, California, for example, just lost a seat so that another seat could go to a smaller state, as an example. Um, so if we took back all those seats that have been given away over the century, that would bring us to that number of 585. We would catch up really for deferred maintenance, um, where we should have just been adding seats mm. as we were growing rather than asking big states to give them to small states. Um, the Wyoming rule would take the population of the smallest state, Wyoming, and make that the basis for the ratio between a representative and a constituent. That would put the ratio at about 580,000 people and would give us 572 members of the House. That's still more than 10 times bigger. It's 15 times bigger than what the, the founding fathers were thinking about. Danielle, there's so much to talk about here. I thank you for uh, the work you've done on this, and the work you'll continue to do on it, and I encourage our readers to sort of catch up to this topic that we don't think about enough, uh, and, and you and I will talk about it some more. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ali. Take good care. Danielle Allen is a professor and the director of the Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University, the founder of the Allen Lab for Democracy Renovation, and the founder and president of Partners in Democracy.